welcome everyone. My name is Michael Zang. I'm the director of the Elie Wiesel Center for, Jew for Jewish Studies at Boston University, where I also teach religious studies and Jewish studies and medieval studies. And um, today we will have as our special guest and reader, Sonari Glinton. Hello, Sonari. Hello. And Sonari is in LA, is that correct? Uh, I like to say the city of West Hollywood. The city of West Hollywood sounds much better. And uh, Sonari is um, a former BU, he's a BU graduate. He graduated from the College of Arts and Sciences, I believe in the spring of 1996. And he, uh, he and I have the special connection that he was a student in the very first class I taught at Boston University back in 1994, an introduction to Judaism. And I know about Sonari that he really wanted to study communication and he is a very accomplished today, a very accomplished broadcast journalist, a long time uh, member of uh, National Public Radio where he was at the business desk and uh, reported on cars and everything having to do with cars. Uh, today he's a broadcast, uh, independent broadcast producer, he's a podcast. Uh, has a podcast company and he's doing other interesting things. He produces content for Fresh Air in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, the reason why he didn't major in broadcast journalism, I read recently, was because he knew that um, in order to take a class with Elie Wiesel at Boston University, which at that time was still possible, um, you really have a better chance of being allowed into that class. There was, of course, an important gatekeeper you had to somehow first work with and work through in order to be even considered. That was Martha Hauptmann. And um, as I read, um, you were told you might have a better chance if you majored in religion or philosophy or history or things of that sort. And that's what you did. So you switch to the humanities, you switch to the College of Arts and Sciences, and that's where you graduate. So welcome. Welcome back to this BU event. Uh, Sonari has also been involved in other activities of the Elie Cell Center for Jewish Studies. Um, was it last year or the year before that we had a big event that you helped put together with um, Andrew, Am Ambassador Andrew Young and Susanna Heschel and Yabila McCoy. Uh, on blacks and Jews and as the conversation, the difficult conversations between blacks and Jews. But that's not your subject today. So Sonari, let me first ask you what you chose to read and why you chose it. Well, um, the book I chose is Here We Are, and it's by uh, uh, my friend uh, Arthi Shahani, who was also on the business desk with me at NPR. And um, it is, it, it turns out that her book is, or it's the subtitle is American Dreams and American Nightmares. And it's essentially about her family's immigration struggle um, over the course of about 20 years. Um, she, Arthi came to America via Casablanca, via uh, India. And um, her father got caught up in a, uh, you know, a cash business ring is like the best way to describe it. Um, you know, a lot of immigrants deal in cash businesses. She, her father had an electronics business. And essentially during the Clinton administration, they got caught up in, you know, there were controls for money laundering. And her father ended up going to uh, jail and Arthi spent a decade of her life trying to free him from prison. And that essentially set her up for becoming an NPR reporter, which is, uh, <laughs> that is. What's the, what's the connection? What's the connection, Sonari? <laughs> well, she was, um, she essentially spent, became an activist and had to do, you know, uh, researched, uh, was really an, a real advocate for immigration reform. Mm -hmm. And then September 11th happened. And it, everything and the urgency and all of that came. And I figured at first I was going to read a book about race, you know, like a book about, you know, one a race relation book because of where we are at. But I figured you guys would just look at me and I would remind you of um, race issues in America while of 
car report at, at NPR, I was stopped by the police more than a dozen times. Um, very rarely issued a citation, but just like to give you an idea, I covered, you know, Rick Santorum and spent the, and, uh, you know, like those sort of things. So I wanted, like, I physically will probably make you think about, you know, imagine me getting stopped, which has happened for walking up the street here, you know, but then I thought, you know, the interesting thing about Ellie Wiesel is this great verbal tick or phrase that he would often say, which is, we're dealing with a race problem in America. I'm gonna, you know, paraphrase. This is not what he would say, but what I would say. We would, we're dealing with a tremendous race problem in America. And yet, we have a tremendous immigration problem. And there are still people in cages on the border. So the intersectionality of, of those things, I just thought was really important. And I should say it was at BU that I fell in love with the Daisy community um, from being a part of a brown person. And I just really also, this is the first book about the 9-11 generation written by um, someone who's South Asian from that point of view. And I think when we think about our immigration problem now, uh, it, this is my story and many other people's story just moved a little bit to the left. You can see how a model immigrant community can turn into um, fugitives uh, at the drop of a dime. And it doesn't matter how American you are or how good you are or how hardworking you are. And I think that that's, um, and Arthi right now is working on a project where talking to economists who have the idea that the problem in America is not too much immigration, it's too little. And so I was gonna, if I would start to read, I would read from the prologue, which sets up the story fairly well. Through a strange coincidence in speaking as Arthi, uh, who has a much better reading voice than I do, through a strange coincidence, I met the man, I met the man who ran the jail where my dad was locked up. How a girl like you visit, start visiting Rikers anyway, he asked me. Well, my dad was an inmate there, I said, not the answer he was expecting. We were hunched over a tiny oak table in one of those quaint cafes on the Upper East Side. I kept stepping on his toes, not on purpose. The jailer, Martin Horn, happened to be friends with a genius mentor of mine. Now retired, Martin liked having meandering conversations with journalists. I'm a journalist, only I wasn't on my A game. He was the one asking all the good questions, digging deeper. Who was a judge in your dad's case, he asked. Why? Maybe I know him. Well, sure he does. Just like because I'm from Queens, I know everyone there. Blumenfeld, I, I humored. The judge was Joel Blumenfeld. Really nice guy. Quick, quite a tone deaf way to describe the, oh, sorry. Is that right, the jailer's eyes lit up? He was one of my best friends. We go way back to the Vietnam War days. Really nice guy. Really nice guy, quite a tone deaf way to describe the man who presided over the case that ruined my family incrementally over the course of 14 years. I think you'll like Joe. You wanna meet him? The jailer, you wanna meet him? The jailer loved connecting people. Let me know if you're interested. He made it sound like a casual Tinder date. These last few years, I've been trying not to think about the past. By any, anyone's measure, I took aggressive steps to forget it. But wherever I turned, there it was. It could ne I could never stop feeling like that teenage girl sitting in court, holding her mom's hand, seeing her father in handcuffs. His once alert eyes crumbled into an empty stare. No matter how hard I tried to be someone else, that's the girl I always was, am. It didn't take longer than a week for me to accept the jailer's offer Joel, Judge Joel Blumenfeld re replied almost instantly, I hear you on the radio, he wrote in his email. Why don't you come by the next time you're in town? When I'm not chasing the skeletons in my family's closet, I'm a correspondent for NPR. I live in California and cover the largest companies on earth, three of which are a short drive for me in Silicon Valley. I was supposed to be scheduling my interview with a billionaire who had invested early in Facebook and Twitter, not with a judge, but being a journalist, 
has its perk, namely access. I get VIP treatment from all kinds of people who otherwise would never give me the time of day. Uh, the judge invited me to his private chambers. That's, that's a place no defendant's kid gets to go. The place behind the courtroom where he writes his decisions about how long someone is sent to prison or whether the convicted can reopen a case. I didn't expect that. And it turns out I was not ready for it. I went, I went during one of my business trips to New York. I took the E train into Queens, just like I used to when I visited dad in jail. That was a lifetime ago. Not much has changed. The McDonald's wrapper tossed on the orange subway seat, the train cars rattling on the tracks like there was an earthquake. Will they ever fix these tracks? I walked down the Queens, down Queens Boulevard and past the bodega. I spotted the dusty glass storefront with the words Avogadro Lawyer stenciled in huge black letters on a tacky yellow awning and cringe thinking about the crap promises they make inside. We'll beat the charge. I know the judge as if, that, as if it were that easy to buy justice in America. When I got to the Queens Criminal Courthouse, it was smaller than I remembered. Maybe that's because the last time I saw it, I had a child's eyes. I put my purse through the scanner and spread my arms like a bird for security. Flashback to teenage me standing in this exact same spot with mom, my big brother, Deepak, and my sister, Anjali. We usually talked a mile a minute. That morning, we were mute. Dad had just been arrested. Miss, what's this supposed to be? The guard pointed out to the x-ray machine, a black blob inside my bag. That's a baton. No, <laughs> this is uh, a scenario. This has happened to me many times. That's my shotgun mic. I should have left out the word shotgun. I use it to record. I won't record anything, I promise. Up in the courtroom, I spotted the pews where the public sits. Flashback to my first time sitting there in the second row. A defense lawyer walked up to the prosecutor right after their hearing. I heard, overheard them joking about each other's golf game. They were golf buddies? I thought opposing county counsel would be at war in all facets of life. Their sliver of an exchange opened my eyes to a basic fact. For most lawyers, justice is just a day job. I walked towards the swinging doors that separate the bench from the audience. A girlfriend had recently taught, taught me about Stuart Weissman's, those are shoes, and I grabbed a pair off their clearance rack. Today, I break them in, a mistake that announced itself in each step. Hi, I have an appointment with Judge Blumenfeld. I handed the bailiff my card. He eyed it and said, give me a sec. I turned a corner and knocked on George Blum uh, Judge Blumenfeld's door. Young lady, I told you to send me the case number. Those were the first words out of his mouth, a scolding, which he didn't bother to give standing still. He walked right past me to his desk, no handshake or hi, nice to see you after all these years, straight to business. Though I wasn't sure what the business was, I didn't have an agenda, I just showed up because I couldn't help myself. He told me in an email to remind him of dad's indictment number. I guess he assumed reasonably that I was coming for a legal opinion. I guess I wasn't because I didn't bother to respond. Still, he was repaired. Without asking before I could sit down, he blurted out a sentence that felt like a punch to the stomach. He said more or less, your dad should have never taken that guilty plea. What a mistake. A jury of his peers in Queens with all these immigrant business owners, no jury would have convicted him here. You have to stop and imagine what that felt like. My, mom, my father was arrested in 1996 along with my little brother. They were running our family business, a wholesale electronics store on Broadway between 27th and 28th streets in Manhattan. It turns out we, we were selling Casio watches and shark calculators to the wrong guys, to members of the Cali cartel of Colombia. Dad and Uncle Rattan were charged with money laundering, helping the most notorious 
drug traffickers in New York City clean their cocaine profits. We hired lawyers. They told us we should not attempt to fight the charges. We agonized over it and followed their advice. And now with the damage long done, the man who hit the gavel was telling me what we thought was true all along but couldn't prove. The Shahani family had a hand to play if only we knew how to play it. The back of my throat burned acrid. I wanted to vomit. The day seemed, obli the judge seemed oblivious that this could somehow be emotional for me. He talked to me as if we were teacher and student dissecting a piece of case law during office hours. Have a seat. He sat on the end of his sofa and patted a cushion beside him. You ever ask yourself, why was the case filed in Queens? Socratic method, I felt dizzy. I didn't have an answer. He did. The fact that it was filed in Queens, he explained, was a sign of its weakness. If it were some high profile, big win for prosecutors, they would have filed it in Manhattan with all the media. The case destroyed dad's career, his reputation, his will to live. It didn't end with the, when the sentence was over. It spiraled into more punishments than my family or the court ever expected. And now the truth comes out. It turned out on the most basic miscalculation. Uh, I could keep going. I was looking at the, the time. Um, but uh, I'll skip to you. And, uh, Michael, did you have an interjection? Or no, no, no. I just want to keep you. I want you to keep on reading. It's fascinating. Yeah. It's also right. Right. Well, I was going to. Uh, all right, so I actually, there's not that much left in the, the, the prologue. Uh, what exactly happened next, I can't remember. I asked the judge if he was working on interesting cases. Maybe we switched topics uh, entirely and talked about sunny California, my new home. In reality, I wasn't listening. It was a mistake to come. I could literally feel the life I was so meticulously building break at the seams. I needed to get the hell out of his office. It would be rude to dart for the door. I had to chit chat, politely reach for my purse to signal it was getting late. Only when I did that, the judge reached for an overstuffed folder and pulled out an envelope in mint condition, except for the green certified mail sticker on the front, which had faded. It was addressed from teenage me to him. Do you remember I called you my pen pal? He asked this time with tenderness in his voice. That's right, my eyes dropped. I didn't want to look at him anymore. I wrote you too much. Not too much. It's just that you cared, he said. Flashback to the first time he called me in court. I stood up in the back and the adults up front looked puzzled, like, why does the judge know this kid? So many things had gone wrong in this case. I decided to write him directly. I wanted the straightest line to justice and I knew it wasn't through lawyers. Now I glanced at the date. It was postmarked October 12, 1999. That was the day of my 20th birthday. I guess that's how I was celebrating. You're such an articulate, passionate kid, he said, like a proud school teacher. That's when it hit me. I'm not meeting this judge because he hears me on the radio. I'm meeting him because he remembers me as a teenager. You know how many letters I got and never answered? But you're, you, I always responded to. It's true, he did, without fail. I'd forgotten about that. Keep it. Oh, I, I tried to put the envelope back in his hands, but he shoved it into mine. Keep it, it's for you. I didn't know it was legal to remove documents from court records, and I didn't want it, but I could tell you, I could tell I wasn't allowed to leave without accepting his gift. Thank you. I slipped the, the envelope into my purse and stood up. I think you've gone you've got some defendants waiting. I always do, he said, chipper again. As I headed for the door, I turned back to ask just one question. Not something I expected to ask, but apparently the only question I had about the case. Do you remember my dad, Namdev Shahani? No, no, I don't. I wish he did. I knew he wouldn't. Dad's letter to him, my father wrote one too, landed on a big, fat ignore pile. While the judge could see me, the good immigrant, who was living the American dream, he could not see the nightmare that I came from, which he played a role in creating. 
My father was invisible to him. To this day, that judge didn't ask whatever came of Mr. Shahani. I, I didn't expect any different. Still, it hurt. Uh, speed walking from the chambers through the courtroom, the three co-defendants sitting just as they had been, tears streamed down my face. Why are you doing this, Arathi? This is self-sabotage. I was almost 30 when dad's legal problems ended, nearly half my life spent watching him decay. I had finally left home and was five years into fixing my credit score, which was a far cry from good. I needed to know I had a future before I could stroll down memory lane. Let it go, Arthi. Let it go. Only I couldn't. Um, so that's the, yeah, um, she tells a story of, of what happened to her family. I'm sorry, it's, she's a very good friend of mine and I, um, I know the story and uh, I, I didn't expect uh, it, it to um, be as quite emotional. The reason I wanted to read the book, I guess was like memory. Um, I didn't want us, like I said, uh, right now, we have a tremendous race problem and we are talking about issues that we should have been talking about for decades. But, um, and yet, uh, there are still, there's still a tremendous immigration problem. And uh, I feel like we're, we're called to open our hearts and our homes to the refugees. And uh, reading about this, like now and last night, this reminds me of the importance of the uh, intersectionality of these things. And um, yeah, that's what I got, Michael. <laughs> That's wonderful, Sonari. Thank you so much for sharing that. Would you be willing, if there are some questions from our participants, to, to answer some questions? Uh, yes, of course, please. Yes. If there are some comments, some questions, do we have something in the chat? Are you, do you want to, uh, are you going to, should I read them or? I am. Just seeing if there is something. I, I don't. I don't see anything yet. So, but uh, people have been very, very uh, courteous in this series, and they listen and they take in and they spend this time with us and don't necessarily speak up themselves. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. The uh, so this is the book. It comes out in paperback in October. Um, I think that it's interesting. As I was saying, it's because it's. Uh, it is really, you know, we, we joke about at NPR about NPR books, right? And it's rare that, you know, when a friend of mine writes a book, you must know this, Michael, your friend of mine writes a book, I tell them for a fact, I am not reading your book. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can't uh, afford to say this. I know I always have to lie and say, yeah, I read your book. It's wonderful. But I, I read this book and I, like I said, it really, it really connected to me. Um, one of the things, though, uh, I will add to a, a, a little thing that I'm doing this weekend is uh, I was talking to Ariel Berger, who is uh, who wrote a very great book, and he's later on in the series, uh, Lessons from the Classroom of Ellie Wazell. And we've been, you know, chatting over the l last year, and uh, we came up with, uh, he reminded me of this you know, phrase that, you know, I'm going to call the Elie Wiesel postulate, which is uh, moral ferocity, this is all paraphrase, moral fer ferocity plus self-reflection equals meaningful action. And uh, in wanting to do something, uh, I realized that Black women are underrepresented in Wikipedia with, along with a friend of mine. And that is in part because 90% of the Wikipedia editors are men. Uh, the, the overwhelming majority of them come from North America, Europe, Australia. 9% uh, female, 1% uh, gender nonconforming. So when you look, there are tremendous holes in people's story. My favorite, I was talking this morning to Michelle Norris, uh, uh, who's gonna be on the Michelle Obama podcast. and a notable person. And looking through her Wikipedia page, it was filled with inaccuracies and things like that. So 
me and a, a group of friends, we're getting together, we're, we're going to train people how to be Wikipedia editors and focus on correcting and elevating the voices of African Americans, especially, uh, uh, especially women of color, fe black female journals. So that, that seems very specific, but you know, people are written, written out of history. And uh, I think that that's like one concrete thing that I can do, which is I can fix Michelle Norris's Wikipedia page and I can go and elevate the voices of African Americans. Uh, and I would say the, uh, and so the Wikithon is on uh, Saturday. You can register, there's a link in the, the chat. Uh, you'll sign up and we'll teach you how to be a, wiki, a Wikipedia editor. And it is really, it's, it's essentially, it's a really useful thing. If you wanna use your, I joke with people, you wanna shuff off of that, you know, that anxiety or need to do something while you're watching Indian Matchmaker on Netflix, you can, uh, you can, you know, correct, uh, you know, a musician's page or, and you guys are experts or, you know, pick the person that you know and just like correct the grammar and get edits and it'll, uh, we can help change the world. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you for the initiative and for telling us about it. There's a, a question in the in the chat that has to do with the with the, your reading, and that is from Mark Reisner, who asks, "How can we change the process of the courts? Should the judge have helped direct the plea bargaining process, or do attorneys need to be retrained?" Is well, there... I, think, I think that what Arthi was pointing out is the sort of the court system that she encountered you can see how, you know, it was really about the larger policy, right? You know, like that there was a policy that was about getting drug cartels, right? And it was so broad that it, you know, caught up, you know, dudes selling Casio watches, right? Mm. Then September 11th happened and we doubled down on that. And um, that's like a real, like the issue that she's been talking about is how do we think about our immigration policy? Because even now, which we've done, it's only, be, it has not become a dynamic policy. The criminal justice system and reform uh, uh, is very complex, but what she's, what I think the point of this is we haven't even thought about uh, really the implications of this system on tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of individuals. And I think that, that that's what that's about. Thank you for that. Oh, last, last, uh, I was going to say, last plug, I have a podcast coming out. It's about the Ford Bronco. You can watch the trailer uh, on, on things. And uh, also, Follow me on Instagram, uh, I'm Sonari1, and you can follow me on Twitter at Sonari, just my first name, and uh, where I engage in politics, the economy, cars, uh, and culture, so. Well, oh, and you can, oh, and then another, another tip for people who like to hear reading, uh, if you have an Amazon Prime account, you can get two free uh, audio books through Audible, so if you already have a Amazon, you can listen to two free books. And I, one of the things I might encourage people to do is, uh, I have the book in hardcover and I've read it in hardcover, but uh, it's a great thing to listen to uh, books. And I think books on tape have gotten a lot better. So um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a tip for you. And uh, everyone can share that. It's, you know, I'm listening to Sherlock Holmes um, in 72 hours. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, with that plug for Audible and uh, audiobooks from someone who is in the audio business, uh, Sonari, it was a great pleasure to spend this half hour with you and I thank everybody for being here.